I'm joined now by Janet Johnson, longtime criminal defense attorney in Northeast Florida. And we're looking at the long and winding road of Florida's death penalty through the lens of one particularly troubling case. It's a case you may well remember, even if you prefer to forget. It's the 2013 kidnapping, rape, and murder of a little girl who vanished while shopping with her mother and sisters at a Northside Walmart. Cherish Periwinkle was just eight years old. Her killer, Donald Smith, was convicted in 2018 and sentenced to death, but he's back in court today arguing to have that conviction overturned. And it's, former, it's his former defense attorneys who must now take the stand to defend their handling of his case. Janet Johnson, what will this hearing focus on? You know, it's interesting, Anne, because I have only once in my 30-year career had a 3850 against me, but these lawyers may actually want to help him to some extent. I mean, it's it's a former, you know, person that was on his side who is now essentially, you know, treated adversarially, but they probably don't want him to be put to death either, quite frankly. They represented him. So what it would look like is, you know, essentially this appellate lawyer is saying, you didn't do five or six things that have actually already been... I'm just going to stop you. So the appellate yeah. lawyer is the one that's now representing Donald Smith, for people who may not know. His second appellate lawyer, because he's already exhausted the first round of appeals to the state court. He lost, and then that was actually affirmed in the U.S. Supreme Court. So now he's allowed to actually go to a state post-conviction attack, where he can directly attack his attorneys and not just the record of the trial. So he is going to be saying ineffective assistance of counsel. That's when you said a 3850. That's basically that kind of claim right. where a defendant comes back to the to the court and says, I didn't get proper representation. Um, and right. so this hearing, he's going to be putting his own attorneys on the stand. I exactly. And those attorneys are essentially going to be defended by the state attorney's office who previously opposed them. So that would be Sheila Loizos who is an appellate attorney at our local state attorney's office. And she has already come out and said the evidence was overwhelming. Nothing his attorneys did could have possibly affected the outcome. But the things that he's picking apart, Donald Smith, with his new appellate lawyers, are things including whether or not he was he consented properly or was properly informed about uh, his decision in court not to have his attorneys cross-examine the victim's mom. So Cherish Periwinkle is the eight-year-old that he was um, at the time charged with, you know, kidnapping and raping and killing. And her mother, Rain Periwinkle, was on the stand. And of course, explain to us typically what happens in a case like that, even if it's a, a difficult case. What will the defense attorneys do to that witness? Sometimes we don't cross-examine them. I mean, it's not a crazy strategy to say this is probably the most sympathetic witness that the jury's going to hear from me getting up there and sort of, you know, beating her up over, well, you said his shirt was red and it was really white, is not going to probably score points, and it could actually deduct points. He apparently made the decision himself and said, I don't think you should cross-examine her. Now he's saying on appeal, I wasn't in a position to make that decision. A, I'm not an attorney, which is true, and B, I had just heard this 911 call. I was very affected by it. And it's your job to basically overrule my decision to the defense attorneys. The defense attorneys may say, well, you know, we concurred with that decision. We actually think that there was no point to be scored by cross-examining this woman who was very sympathetic. And it wasn't going to necessarily negate the video evidence and the DNA evidence. So we, we decided as well not to do it. It, regardless, it is sort of a, they can't get into his brain. You know, as a defense attorney, you, you can't actually, you know, substitute, you know, some other logic for your client's logic. And they consented to what he wanted. And I think that the judge is going to say that that's not reversible error. Judges have previously said that in this case. Um, looking back at the record, uh, you know, this was a decision that he seemed to make on the fly, but they tried to put on the record in open court, you know, what he was saying, and the judge questioned him at length. So what gaps might there be from a legal standpoint in terms of his appeal to say that, you know, he wasn't properly considered or perhaps didn't know all the consequences of that decision? Well, I think regarding that decision, I don't think he has a lot to stand on. I think one of the stronger issues is that basically one of the jurors had said that they couldn't essentially be fair and impartial because they were, you know, had known about the case and were already biased against him. And they checked no at first and switched to yes. That person ended up on the jury. That's a fairly strong case. It hasn't obviously worked in front of the 
Florida Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court. But I think that that's a, a decent argument. They should have changed the venue. I, arguably, this was not a fair venue to have a trial. Those are that's a good argument. And then in the penalty phase, he has a fairly strong argument. Um, I know why the defense attorneys did this, but their first witness was an expert who was cross-examined by Melissa Nelson, who's our state attorney, and who said, you know, is there anything mitigating about this person? And they said no, and that was the defense's expert. Uh, In the end, they put that person on because their point was the state of Florida failed when they let him out of prison so he could essentially go and do this again three weeks later. Uh, I'm not sure that should be your first witness. You certainly wouldn't want that to be what the jury you know, has in their mind. That, that's a pretty decent argument, I think. I'm not sure it's going to work, but it's a decent argument. Yeah, that was Heather Holmes, who was the, um, right. she's a, psychiatr- a psychologist who examined him, and she said that, that she had concluded he was the most dangerous pedophile she'd ever encountered in her their career. Right. Now, at that point, we're not talking guilt or innocence. We're talking death or life. And, you know, defense attorneys will argue, and Al Chipperfield, who was a public defender for years, he had one of the best arguments is, you know, he's going to die in prison either way. The question is whether the state of Florida decides when that is, the governor, Ron DeSantis in this case, or whether God decides when that is. And, you know, that the argument isn't this guy's a great guy, you should let him out. The argument is he's going to die in prison, but don't make it the death penalty that decides that. So they put someone on who isn't going to say, you know, this guy's innocent. But what they were hoping she would be able to say is, you know, he's not entirely responsible for his actions because the state of Florida dropped the ball, gave him a sentence where he was able to get out and reoffend three weeks later. The jury obviously wasn't swayed by that at all. Yeah, there was one interesting thing that I remember came out at the original trial, which was that he'd actually tried to Baker Act himself uh, just hours really before this incident happened. Um, So that was one of the things that they said the state failed to kind of keep him in custody as dangerous as they knew he was. Uh, But I want to ask you about the death penalty, just kind of big picture, because I think a lot of people are frustrated when they realize a case like this has gone on and on for families as well. You know, every time a case or is, a, you know, is there an appeal or a motion filed, they're notified. So this kind of remains top of right. mind for them. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's an argument against the death penalty, quite frankly. And it's an argument in negotiations that defense attorneys say, we will plead to life. A lot of the time, that's an offer on the table from the defense to spare everybody all these uh, appellate procedures that are automatic. I mean, the first appeal is automatic. And then once that direct appeal is denied, automatically the attorney general gets a, a notified and there's a secondary appellate process. So there's an argument that if you want closure for the family, life in prison does that you know, as well and maybe better than the death penalty because it's, it, there's an infinite number of appeals essentially for the death penalty. You, I think her family wanted the death penalty. I don't think they would have accepted life, but it is. It's painful in, in that process. I do think that they're probably told along the way This is just a formality. It used to be that these hearings on the 3.850, this is a 3.851 because it's the death penalty, used to be they were automatically, we're not going to have a hearing because it's so open and shut. But that came back on appeal. And so judges now grant them because, you know, what's the harm in having his day in court? And that's one less, you know, issue that can be raised later to say, look, the judge didn't even give me this hearing. They essentially, if there's anything on paper, and this was a fairly well-written, extensive 3.851, the 3.851, then they're going to do a hearing. So that's where we are this week. So it's going to be back before the ori- original judge in the case, Mallory Cooper. It begins today, probably run a couple days. Janet Johnson, thank you so much for being here and walking us through what to expect in this uh, next couple of days. Thanks for having me. Great to see you.